Okay, everyone, we're, welcome to the Van der Wettering Hour. Uh, we're going to have Double John. And to start with, we're going to have a circuit extraction uh, for ZX Diagrams' shot P-HUD. Uh, thanks, Matthew. Yeah, so I'll be giving the next two talks. So sorry, you have to, yeah, you have to stick with me for the next hour. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Neil and Alex, who are both in this room somewhere. There's Alex, there's Neil. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be telling you about how it's actually really hard to extract a circuit from a ZX diagram. So this result can be um, um, summarized in a single slide. So if, you, if this is the only thing you take away from this talk, that's great. So uh, we are given as input a sum ZX diagram. The, and the only promise we're given is that it is unitary. And we need it to be unitary because any quantum circuit is unitary. So if it's not unitary, we obviously can't get a circuit out of it. And then the output should be a description of a quantum circuit of the same unitary. And then our theorem is that this circuit extraction problem is sharp P hard. Uh, how hard is this? Well, uh, strong quantum circuit simulations, this is where you uh, estimate, estimate uh, marginal probabilities or amplitudes of a quantum circuit, is sharp P complete. So that means circuit extraction, like getting a circuit out of it, is at least as hard as just computing properties of a diagram directly. Um, so this means that in this general black box case, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to work. It's, you're better off just calculating the stuff from the diagram directly. Okay, so first, like, why do we actually care about circuit extraction, right? So suppose we want to use ZX diagrams for circuit optimization. Now, a thing we could do is we can first write our circuit as a ZX diagram. This is really straightforward. Then we can simplify a diagram using whatever strategy you want, and you get out some ZX diagram. But generally, this ZX diagram won't look like a circuit. So you need to translate it back into an equivalent circuit in order to do something with it, because a circuit is something you can actually run on a quantum computer. Uh, yeah, so if you want to run a ZX diagram on a quantum computer, it needs to be a circuit. There's an asterisk there, and I'll come back to that later. But yeah, so this is why we want to do circuit extraction, right? There are a couple of known techniques, which Tommy already, uh, already discussed. Um, and so all of these techniques, all these three papers were already mentioned in his talk, um, they're all about a certain type of flow condition, right? So this is a kind of condition on a diagram, which is about sort of local structure. So it's sort of telling you that the connectivity of the diagram is very special in such a case that um, it prevents the diagrams from becoming too wild in sort of the intermediate setting. And so it turns out that if you don't have any condition like this, then it becomes really hard to extract the circuit. And that's what I will show next. So first, a formal definition of the circuit extraction problem. Uh, so the input is a ZX diagram D. It has N inputs and outputs. The number of inputs and outputs it must be equal because it represents a unitary. And it has at most K wires and or spiders. And we are also given a set G of unitary gates. So this can be uh, a very general description. Of, obviously, it has to be supplied in some efficient way. But uh, this exact set of gates doesn't really matter for our result. And then we are given a promise, which is that the linear map this diagram represents is proportional to unitary. Proportional meaning up to a non-zero scalar factor. Uh, and then the output of the algorithm should be either a circuit describing unitary or a message that no such circuit exists. Um, and yeah, and this circuit should be polynomial in size in uh, the number of qubits and number of gates. Um, if it wasn't polynomial size, it wouldn't be efficient to start with. So this, I think, is a reasonable condition to ask for. Okay, so before we go into the hardness of this, uh, let's give a brief rundown on some complexity theory. So an NP-complete problem is, of course, set, uh, which is at, you're given a Boolean formula specified in some way, and you ask, does this thing have a satisfying assignment? Hopefully a thing that most of us are familiar with. Um, and then there is a complexity class that is called a sharp P, or number P, and this is the counting version of NP. So now we don't care about, is there a solution, but how many solutions are there? And a sharp P complete problem is called counting set, or sharp set. And this is, uh, we, have, we are given a Boolean formula, and I ask you, what is the number of solutions to this formula? Um, okay, and then there is, just to uh, sort of um, uh, hammer, uh, hammer in how, uh, how hard this complexity class is, a TODAS theorem says that if you have a uh, Turing machine, so a polynomial time Turing machine, with access to a sharp P oracle, uh, the entire polynomial hierarchy is, is contained herein. Okay, so if we have a sharp oracle, we can solve any any problem in the polynomial hierarchy. So this is a really big complexity class. Okay, so our main result is that number set, Cook reduces actually Cook one reduces to circuit extraction. This means that if we are given a, a, a polynomial time Turing machine with access to a circuit extraction oracle, we can solve number set. Actually, we can solve a number set instance with just a single call to circuit extraction. 
uh, a corollary of this is that if there is a polynomial time algorithm for circuit extraction, then the entire polynomial hierarchy collapses, and in particular, p equals np. Okay, so very unlikely that there is, in fact, a polynomial time, al a polynomial time algorithm for circuit extraction. So a brief sketch of the proof. So suppose we are given some Boolean formula, right? This is specified in some polynomial number of clauses. Um, and we want to determine the number of solutions to this thing, so the number of times it returns one. So first we construct this ADEX diagram for a linear map LF, which uh, when, when you put in a computational basis state, it uh, outputs um, the value of this Boolean formula. This is really straightforward to do. This is just standard techniques. Uh, and now we make an observation that if we input the all plus states, so these green spiders are all plus states, um, then what we are actually calcula calculating is we get a quantum state out where we, in the amplitudes of the state, we have now counted how many solutions there are, right? So you have this A0 uh, times 0 plus A1 times 1, and this A0 and A1 are the proportions of how many times this uh, Boolean formula is satisfiable. And so we can write this as like uh, the y, a Y rotation applied to the zero state, and this alpha is uniquely determined by the number of solutions to F, okay? And now what we do is we use this state we prepared, which is, can be represented as some small ZX diagram, as the input to a controlled operation. This is like a controlled uh, IX operation. Uh, and we can verify with a simple ZX calculation that this entire diagram is now equal to an X rotation, where again, this alpha is uniquely determined by the number of solutions. So this means that if we feed the diagram one, if we feed this to a circuit extraction oracle, right, because we know it's unitary, we know it's an X rotation, if we feed this to our circuit extraction oracle, it will spit out the circuit. And this is now a one qubit circuit, and it consists of polynomial number of gates. So we can just multiply out the gates in polynomial time, because they're all single qubit gates, so it's, they're small matrices. And uh, using this, we can actually calculate alpha, right? So we can determine alpha, and then we've solved a number of solutions problem. So we are done. So why this works, to repeat, is the diagram itself contains polynomial number of spiders, but the circuit only has a single qubit. So this means that the circuit that we uh, output has polynomial number of gates, but we can still multiply out all the gates polynomial number of time, and uh, we only need to know the value of alpha to a polynomial number of precision, because uh, they can be exponentially close, but we have, if you have polynomial number of bits, we can still specify this exactness so it all works out. Uh, yeah, so we, this, this, this all works. Uh, maybe some additional, um, uh, some adi a, a different way you can view this result is we can view the same diagram as a post-selected quantum circuit, okay? So we, ha we have here our sort of our, um, our oracle UF, this is sort of a standard classical oracle that encodes uh, the solution to a problem in, a, in a, an additional qubit, and we post-select all the things. Um, but what is interesting here is that the correct post-selection probability is always larger than one-fourth and is independent of n. So this means we can actually do this thing on the real quantum computer. We can just give this quantum computer and do the post selections many times, and like after like uh, an estimate of four times, we will get the correct post selection. So we could implement the circuit with high probability in real quantum computers. So what's the catch? The adjacent values of alpha are exponentially close. So you would need to take an exponential number of samples in order to estimate your alpha. So running this on a quantum computer actually doesn't work because you need exponential samples. So um, yeah. So what? What this actually says is that our result is not about post selection and being able to deal with that. It's about getting a really precise description of a circuit out. And that's the reason we can extract this value alpha. Uh, yeah, a, a, coroll, uh, a corollary of this result is that um, if I give you sort of a related problem, if I give you a post selected quantum circuit with the promise that it is unitary, then removing the post selections in the circuit, so get, giving me an equivalent circuit without post selections, is also sharp sharply hard. Because this is essentially the same problem as I've, as I've just been describing. Um, there are a couple of variations we can consider. So first of all, I was, uh, this result now only works for unitary quantum circuits, right? Uh, but we can also consider a, uh, that we weaken what our outputs may be. So now I say our outputs can also contain a logarithmic number of auxiliary qubits, measurements, and classical corrections. It's important here that it's a logarithmic number of ancilla, um, because that means that our, the, size of the, matrix, the size of the matrices will still be polynomial in our instances. So then we can still efficiently calculate it. So even with a small number of ancilla, the extraction is still hard. We can also consider approximate circuit extraction. So here I'm also given a precision parameter epsilon. And as long as the circuit size we have is allowed to depend log uh, polylogarithmically on the, on the one over epsilon, 
then um, getting the circuit tracking is still sharply hard. So again, the poly log here is important, um, although we can consider weakening this, and it turns out this will still be hard, but in a different way. So I'll get to that now, which is the final variation we will consider. So our motivation for why we want to do circuit extraction is because we want to have some way of putting a selection diagram on a quantum computer. But we can also think, well, can we just cut out the middleman and just imagine, because what we really want is we want to get some samples out of this unitary ZX diagram. So if, suppose I have a black box and I, I input a ZX diagram and I get samples from the unitary out. Right? That, that's really what we want. And the circuit is just sort of a, a way to get there. So let's consider the following problem, unitary ZX sampling. So we are again given a ZX diagram with the promise it is unitary. And now the output should be a sample, like a bit string, from a probability distribution given by a unitary. So just read the Born rule by the unitary that uh, is describing our diagram, right? And so it turns out that um, we can show that NP randomly polynomially reduces the unitary ZX sampling, which means that if we have a, um, if we have a uh, probabilistic Turing machine with access to the unitary ZX sampling oracle, we can solve NP complete problems. And this, we proved this using a variation on the argument we've seen before, but then uh, using uh, the valiant vazirani theorem. So this shows that it's very unlikely that any procedure, even bypassing circuit extraction, will get us a way to put ZX diagrams on a quantum computer. Yeah, so a corollary is, yeah, that if there was such a procedure, that NP would be a BQP, which is expected not to be the case. Uh, so conclusion, circuit extraction is hard. Uh, allowing approximate extraction or some ancillary uh, doesn't make it easier. And in fact, any way to get samples out of unit XX diagram is at least NP hard. Uh, so future work would be, uh, well, what's the exact complexity of circuit extraction? We, we say it, it's, we know it's at least sharp P hard, and we have a bound that is uh, NP to the NP to the sharp P, which is really, really big. Uh, so the question is, is there like, is it complete for that or is it weaker than that? We don't actually know. And uh, another interesting question is, here we are considering a single select diagram, but you might also be interested if you are given a deterministic measurement pattern, right, where you don't necessarily have G-flow, you just know that for the specific choice of angles it is deterministic, can you then extract it? Like, then there is more restrictions on the shape of the diagram, so that might make it easier to get a thing out, but we don't actually know. So this might be sharply hard, it might be easier, it's still an open question. Uh, and that's all I want to say about this, so thank you for listening. Thanks, John. Um, we've got Ernesto. Thanks for the nice talk. So uh, for this motivation of circuit extraction, because you can do simplifications and then go back to circuit, right? But might it be the case that the simplifications that you do keep the circuit within a certain class, which is not sharp complete? Yes, yes, exactly. So um, the, the three papers I gave here, they're exactly about this. So they, they give you rewrite strategies that preserve certain invariants of the diagram, so G-flow or extended G-flow or Pauli flow. And in those cases, we know how to efficiently extract a circuit. In any case, if I know that um, I am given a unitary described as a ZX diagram, and I then do a polynomial number of rewrites to it, I know I can always get it back into a circuit, at least an NP, because there's, there's a, there is a certificate, right? Because I can just give you all these steps backwards and then get a circuit out. So if the diagram is within a polynomial number of rewrites from a, from a circuit, it must be an NP. So that's easier. Um, so this is really about sort of diagrams you get in, in other ways. your intuition about what are the usual rewrite strategies and rule with respect to staying within one of these bounds which keeps you because we have a lot of practice with rewriting by hand and we always get there one way or another so that there is some empirical evidence that it kind of works so um a whole while back alex and me we came up with a circuit where you do some reasonable rewrites and then it's unclear how to get back a circuit out I mean, obviously you can do the rewrites backwards and get a circuit the problem there was we wanted we were looking at reducing the t count of a diagram and there are sort there are sort of there's sort of two classes of rewrites that do this you have your sort of black box rewrites which don't treat your non clifford phases as like a specific angle but it's sort of a black box angle that you don't touch and you just fuse these angles and this always seems to preserve nice invariants that allow you to extract. But if you apply um, procedures like um, um, 
like like the Todd algorithm from uh, from from Howard Campbell or the uh, by Matthew Amy, the results on read multi decoding, they're specific to T-gates, and they can reduce the T-count. And if you do this on the, on the SELECT diagram, you get into a shape where it is not clear anymore how to get to a circuit, and you can prove, in fact, that you get diagrams where without increasing the T-count, there is no way to write as a circuit without measurement and ancilla. Uh, so we know you must do something more complicated if we don't have any techniques for it yet. So, John, you kind of gave an example of a certificate that this diagram was unitary being it used to be a circuit and I rewrote it to something weird. What else could be a certificate? So if I give you the promise, what is actually the thing that I'm giving you? So a G flow, for instance. Um, yeah, just some, yeah, like uh, if I give you, uh, if you're giving me a ZX diagram, I can efficiently verify whether it has a G flow. So I guess it's not really a certificate, it's just something I can efficiently check. The question, yeah, the question is, are there any certificates that, um, um, that aren't easy to find yourself, but that still allow you to efficiently extract the, is that another question? Okay. Yeah, so in these examples, the proof that your promise that it's unitary holds actually gives you a recipe to do the extraction. So I'm just wondering what other pr proofs that it's unitary that you might be given that could help you to do extraction. Uh, so, John may have some idea after some reflection. Um, I wonder whether or not there might be a bit of a confusion here. We're describing a promise problem. So, you aren't necessarily provided any certificate that, uh, that, that the ZX diagram represents a unitary. It's just under the condition that it does represent a unitary, you're hoping to have a procedure to do that. If your ZX diagram doesn't happen to represent a unitary, your procedure may still do something, but it might not be what you hoped. So it's in this class of promise problems where the condition that we're expressing might not even be efficiently evaluatable, but under, the, under those conditions, you might be able to achieve something. Yeah, to reiterate that, we could also consider this problem without any promise, and it would be harder even, because then the answer can also be, this diagram is not unitary, abort. So that makes it harder, the problem, but yeah. My question links directly to this. Uh, so how? How does making the problem a bit easier, so uh, adding this promise, help you in your proofs? So, like, when do you it, use this promise? It doesn't help us. It's just something that we consider very reasonable. Like, we think the circuit extraction problem, you should only consider diagrams that are unitary, because otherwise you will definitely fail. I mean, you can also consider the problem, I give you a ZX diagram, now tell me if it's unitary or not. And we also analyze the complexity of that, and we find that it is, um, uh, like we have here, uh, NP to the NP to the Sharpie. Uh, determining whether a ZX diagram is unitary is in NP to the Sharpie, I think. Is that correct, Neil? Yeah, or yeah. NP to the Sharpie, depending on how you perturbation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that is easier. Um, I mean, it might even be easier. That's just an upper bound you give, but yeah. Um, so you had earlier, you had a slide where you said that um, contingent on this being efficiently doable, you would collapse the polynomial hierarchy and you would have P equals NP. Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So th this follows from Toda's theorem. Um, so that's from, from Toda's theorem here. So aren't... Isn't this relative to an oracle, though? I mean, it, on, on the next slide, you have um, sat is in so, P to so, the circuit extraction. So the reason this, the reason this works is um, if circuit extraction is in P, right, then a, a circuit extraction oracle it doesn't give you any more power because P to the P is the same as P. Yeah, OK. So you're saying, OK, if it's in P, yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah, this is why if there is polynomial time allegory, it's collapse. Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering, I was curious if your result also uh, somehow connects to like learning problem. I mean, what I mean is that assuming that the diagram is, uh, is a, something like an unknown unitary or black box unitary, does this also say like the circuit is extraction problem has any relation to learning problem of that unitary? I don't know exactly what you mean by a learning problem for a unitary, so um, I the content this. Yeah, something like pack learnability from the like learning theory perspective, because it, to, 
to me it seems that it can have like nice relation as um, as I, I, sorry, I, I don't really understand, but let us discuss it, uh, let us discuss okay, this yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Okay, one more question, <laughs> Miriam. Yeah, so you've um, got this condition that them, uh, the, the sort of B part of your definition that um, there might not be a circuit that actually represents that thing. So is that just due to kind of if, um, if you've got a non-unitary set of gates and your diagram is outside the set that is exactly representable? Um, yeah, so you could imagine a sort of trivial solution here. If, if my set of G, if my set of gates G is empty, I can just always output like no, it doesn't exist. Or no, actually, that might still be hard because the identity is an empty set of gates. So that 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 reduces to is this thing the identity, which might still be hard. But yeah. Um. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's uh, thank John again, partially. <laughs> <laughs> John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. You have to stick with me for a while longer. <laughs> okay, go for it. Um, so um, now for a completely different kind of thing, but still ZXC. Uh, so this is joint work, also with Alex, but also with uh, with Renault. Um, and yeah, it's about how we can do uh, classical simulation of quantum circuits using ZX diagrams in a sort of a, a smart way. So. What we do is, um, the problem we're trying to solve is to do somewhat efficient simulation of quantum circuits, right? Like only somewhat, because of course we don't expect this to be entirely efficient, we just want to be able to do it as efficiently as possible. And so broadly I would say there's two classes of ways to do this. There are the tensor network based methods, and these include just direct state simulation, um, and then there's a, like also just um, any kind of tensor network contraction methods like, like principal component analysis, contraction order finding, edge cutting, there's a, whole, there's a whole zoo of techniques you can use here. But broadly, they all scale exponentially in number of qubits. And then there are stabilized decomposition based methods. Uh, there's like stabilized extent, the stabilized rank, and I'm gonna tell you more about what this is. Uh, and broadly, these scale exponentially not a number of qubits, but a number of non-Clifford resources of the, of, the, of the circuit, okay? So this talk is about stabilizer rank. So what is this? Well, um, I think most of you are familiar with, uh, with the gottesman knill theorem. And this says that if I have a quantum computation which consists of stabilizer states, Clifford unitaries, and stabilizer measurements, I can efficiently classically simulate the outcomes here, right? Now there's an observation, which is that the stabilizer states, they span the entire space of states. So I can always write an arbitrary quantum state as a, um, as a linear combination of stabilizer states, okay? And uh, this requires a number of terms, in this case, chi, and we call chi the stabilizer rank of this state, okay? So this uh, suggests a simulation algorithm. Now we start with a clifford pastis circuit. Uh, clifford pastis is approximately universal, so we can always do this. Then we write each T-gate as a magic state injection, so we can sort of take all the non-Clifford stuff and put it at the beginning of the circuit. And then we decompose the T-states into sums of stabilizer states, which means that now we get a sum of Clifford circuits. Now, each of these Clifford circuits can be efficiently classically simulated. Uh, we add the results together, and then we're done. Obviously, with some caveats, but we're done. Uh, the catch is that the stabilizer rank here, so if you have k t states, the stabilizer rank of decomposing all of this scales exponentially with k. But luckily, it's not just 2 to the k, we can actually do a bit better here. And that's the reason people care about this, because you can do something more efficient. So how does this work? Well, if you just have a single T magic state, right, and remember this is just 0 plus e to the i pi 4, 1, this obviously has stabilizer rank 2, because it's a sum of 0 and 1, which are both stabilizer states, so it has rank 2. And this means that if we take uh, k of them, we can each decompose them independently, and we get 2 to the k terms, okay? But we can do better, because if you have two T magic states, we can group the terms better in a smart way, and we see we have these two bell-like states, which both are stabilizer. So in fact, uh, two T states also have a stabilizer rank of two. So this means if you decompose the T magic states pairwise, we only require two to the K over two states. So two to the 0 0.5 K. So this makes the exponential scaling much more gentle. It turns out that if you have six T magic states, you can find a decomposition which has seven terms. This was found by Bravi Smithers Molin with like, um, uh, yeah, some kind of like algorithm that, that just tries to find these things. Um, and so this gives you a scaling of two to the alpha k, where alpha is uh, zero point, roughly 0 0.467. Um, 
Yeah, and this was for a long time the best known, but since then we've seen better ones. I'm going to get to that as well. So uh, this alpha, I'm going to use this number as sort of an indication of, of hardness in the rest of the talk. So alpha sort of means your exponential scaling. Okay. So our idea is to do all of this, but instead of using circuits, we use ZX diagrams. The benefit of doing so is we can optimize intermediate steps in the simulation that hopefully reduce our T count and hence make the, gentle, the, the exponential scaling more gentle. Right? Uh, this is, is described in two papers, uh, which I'm going to talk about both. The first is just sort of the basic idea of this, of just like you just plug in ZX diagrams and see what happens. It turns out to work really well. In the second idea, we use more ZX specific tricks that make the scaling work even better. We use some decompositions of T magic states that um, weren't considered before and would be hard to consider if you don't have ZX diagrams. But we'll get to that. So first, what is the algorithm we propose? So our first step is we, we write our Clifford plus T circuit as a ZX diagram, or really we plug in a state we want to like input and we plug in an effect we want to sort of calculate from and that is the scalar ZX diagram we get. Then we simplify this diagram with like with your favorite algorithm, whatever you want. Uh, you pick some spiders here that have a T-like phase or a non-Clifford phase, and you decompose these as a sum of stabilized states. This means we now have a sum of diagrams now, we simplify each of these diagrams separately and hopefully kill some additional uh, non-Clifford sp spiders. And we just repeat this for each diagram, right? So then each of these diagrams we get, we again decompose until each of the diagrams is small enough or simple enough that we can directly evaluate the value it is equal to. Yeah, so we simply evaluate all these diagrams uh, and then we have an outcome and hopefully we are happy. So uh, let's go through all these steps in a bit more detail and see how this works. So first step is writing your as a circuit as a ZX diagram, and this is quite straightforward. So um, there's just a one-to-one -one translation for the common quantum gates. So here have a C not gate, an S gate, Hadamard gates, T gates. These are all just like standard components of a ZX diagram. I also have this um, sort of uh, an input of a computational basis state and a post-selection to a computational measurement effect. This is just so that we can represent amplitudes and probabilities. For instance, if I want to represent this uh, a single amplitude of a quantum circuit, so I input all zeros and I check what's the, what's the amplitude that I get uh, this outcome x, and I can represent this as a ZX diagram, where u is decomposed using these uh, gate representations of a ZX diagram. So this just represents a scalar, right? There's no inputs or outputs, just a, a complex scalar value. This is for a single amplitude. To calculate a marginal probability, we use this thing that's called a doubling technique. So here we are calculating the marginal probability of the first k qubits, and we are tracing out the bottom qubits, which is like they're connected by a wire, which is a trace. And we see that here we have doubled u, so we get u and u dagger. And this is potentially catastrophic, because remember, our techniques scale exponentially in the number of t gates. So if u contains k t gates, then u dagger will also contain k t gates. So now we have a diagram with 2k t gates. So we've now made a problem much, much worse because you have way more t gates. In practice, it turns out that many of these things sort of like uh, go along the wires and cancel out. And in practice, this is really not that bad. But there are, there are also ways to get around this issue, which I might get into at the end. Okay, so just a short note. Um, there's two types of simulation for quantum circuits. Uh, it's probably more, but there's two that I care about. Um, there's weak simulation which means um, I want you to approximately sample from the output distribution of your quantum circuit. So the output there I get are bit strings that follow a certain measurement distribution. And there is strong simulation, which means um, give me the actual probability uh, that of, of observing a certain outcome or a certain marginal probability. And as the names imply, strong simulation allows you to do weak simulation. Um, and a weak simulation is BQP complete, and strong simulation is sharp P complete, so it's actually much harder. Uh, we are doing exact strong simulation here, so we are exactly calculating the values of um, marginal probabilities or amplitude probabilities. And we are using these to do weak simulation. Okay, so that's the first part fixed, so writing the circuit as a ZX diagram. So now on to optimizing ZX diagrams. So I'm not going to go into the details how we do this, because this is all explained in the previous paper. Uh, reducing t count with ZX calculus. The idea of this strategy is that we are given a ZX diagram, which has um, sorry, inputs and outputs, and there's all these internal spiders that are not connected to inputs and outputs, but connected to other spiders. And we try to remove as many of those spiders as possible. Um, 
And in the process, we hopefully are able to fuse spiders, which cancel T gates, and then uh, make our diagram more Clifford. Okay. And once you've done that, you get a diagram that looks something like this. Um, the reason this looks so complicated, because this is an actual sort of real world circuit that we simplified, and this is what it looks like. Uh, you see it has no inputs and outputs, because again, we are considering an amplitude. Um, and you see there's two types of spiders here. There are sort of the, the lower ones, and there are the top ones, um, which we call phase gadgets, and I'll explain a bit more about this later. Um, but we get this type, of or this type of diagram, and they are all connected via these uh, blue edges, which are Hadamard edges, so there's a Hadamard in between those things. Um, the important thing to remember about these things, there's, like, there's uh, a couple of properties that are important for this, is we get a diagram where every spider either carries a non-Clifford phase or it is part of a phase gadget, which means it is a non-Clifford phase connected to a spider without any phase on it. Right? So if you look at the previous things, we have the phase gadgets on top and we have the non-Clifford phases on the bottom there. Why is this important? This means that if our original circuit had KT gates, then the resulting diagram we get has at most 2K spiders, right? Because uh, a phase gadget gives you two spiders and the other spider gives you one spider. And they, uh, the only, only non-Clifford spiders contribute to this. And this is regardless of the number of qubits or gates, right? So if I give you a circuit with 10 million gates, but it has 10 uh, T gates, then your diagram will have at most 20 spiders at the end, right? So it doesn't matter how big the original circuit was. Okay, so that's optimizing select diagrams. Uh, now the final part, decomposing magic states. So this is the thing we've been using for uh, the first paper, which is uh, the thing I alluded to in the uh, first for the, the bravi smiths molin decomposition. So we see on the left side, we have six uh, T magic states, so six spiders with a pi over four phase. On the right hand side, we have seven terms, this is a sum of diagrams, where each of the diagrams has a Clifford phase, so it's a multiple of pi over two, the phase. Okay, so we can exchange these six spiders, the six T spiders for seven diagrams, so the sum of seven diagrams which are now more Clifford. Okay? So what do we do with this? Well, we, we take our diagram, and we just pick some spiders, which you can do essentially at random. We don't have any good strategy yet how to select these. Uh, you just pick some of these spiders and you unfuse a pi over four spider so that we see these six magic states in the bottom there. And then we apply the magic state decomposition we have here. Okay, we just apply this. Then those six spiders are replaced by the Clifford things. Then we fuse them back in. And again, our simplification strategy can kill additional things because there's more Clifford there. So we can make the diagram smaller. And we just repeat that. So the full algorithm would be that after the first decomposition, we have seven diagrams, we simplify all the diagrams, we do it again, then we have seven times seven diagrams, and we repeat this until there, are, until there aren't six magic states to decompose. Then we can also use a smaller decomposition to get rid of the, the final ones, or we can just directly evaluate the diagrams. Um, yeah, and then we just sum all the values and we get the amplitude or, pro or probability we were calculating. Okay, so this is, um, this is the algorithm we, we used in the first paper. Uh, we can do a bit better, which is what we did in the second paper. So before showing you the results of how well this works, I'm first going to explain to you what we did in the second paper that makes this work even better. So uh, shortly uh, uh, before we we've, we've published the first paper, this paper came out, improved upper bounds on the stabilizer rank of magic states. Uh, and they found an improved stabilizer decomposition. For one thing, they found a 6 into 6 decomposition. This improves on the 6 to 7, and this gives you better exponential scaling. But they also gave you, they also gave an entire family of decompositions of bigger and bigger uh, states that um, get you better and better scaling up to some alpha that's slightly smaller than 0.4. Than okay. Um, now, how does this work? So they use something they call cat states, which um, is um, sort of a superposition of T magic states. It's sort of like a, like, a, like a bell state, but instead of having superposition over 0 and 1, you have superposition over like T magic states. And what is nice for us is that these are, have a very nice representation in ZX. So they use cat states purely as sort of a vehicle for designing new stabilized decomposition of magic states. They don't use cat states directly in the quantum circuits. But because they have such a nice representation in ZX, we can use them directly. So what, so what they do is they find a good decomposition of cat 6, so cat state with 6 qubits. Uh, and in ZX, this looks something like this. So you get three terms. Right? So this is really good, because if we can find in our diagram something that looks like the left-hand side, we can exchange six magic states for three terms. Okay? So if we could do this, we get, a, get an alpha of 0 0.264, which is way better than what, what we had before. Uh, it turns out you can do even better. 
because a cat four state has its decomposition into two terms. This will give you alpha is 0 0.25. All right, so the question is, can we actually find these things in the diagrams? Um, and the answer is yes, because if you look at a phase gadget on the left, or a phase gadget that's connected only to T magic state, we can use an unfusing, and we spot that we actually have a cat state. So an n legged phase gadget is actually a cat n plus 1 state, right? So as long as we have phase gadgets in our diagram, we can uh, remove these with this more efficient decomposition. Yeah, so as long as there's phase gadgets, we can do this. Uh, but even if there was no phase gadgets, we can, uh, we can find a technique, and, 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 and this was found by Renault, uh, that allows us to do a partial decomposition. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we have five T magic states. Now we observe that uh, it's equal to the thing on the right. And if, you, if you're familiar with ZX, you can sort of like see, oh, if I fuse the top T gates, then the phase cancel and copies through the Hadamard and it copies through the spider and it all disconnects. So you can see they're sort of equal if you're a bit used to ZX calculus. And then we spot that this is a CAT6 state. So we can apply our 6 to 3 decomposition. And now our right-hand side have, has three terms and each term has a single T magic state. So these things are no longer stabilizer states but they have less t magic states, okay? So we are trading five magic states for three terms with one magic state. So effectively, this is removing four magic states. So this gives us a four to three decomposition, which gives us a scaling of alpha is 0 0.396, which matches the asymptotic scaling found by Kasim et al. Um, so they find it in sort of the limit of really large diagrams, and we find it for sort of a cons for like a finite size diagrams. So this gives you sort of better asymptotic scaling. And as far as I understand, this is the best proven scaling for this kind of thing that, that currently exists. Okay, so instead of just decomposing randomly, we actually have like a preference for dec 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 decomposition, right? We are first looking for phase gauges with a certain number of legs, and only then are we looking for any five T siders. And so this gives us better decomposition here. So how well does this work? Okay, so I'm going to show you some benchmarks later, but there's also a theoretical argument for why this should scale at least a little bit better than previous methods. So in the worst case, uh, all our extra work on optimizations actually doesn't help, and we don't remove any additional T-like phases during simplification. Right, so in this case, what we do is we just decompose the diagrams, and we remove the Clifford parts that we have, but at no point are we actually removing additional T-like phases. So in this setting, uh, after every decomposition, each diagram only needs a constant number of rewrites, because you're only removing a fixed number of spiders. The size of the diagram is order k, where k is the number of t gates. So this means a rewrite costs order k squared, and this is because we're doing graph rewriting, so there's a k squared cost there. We have 2 to the alpha k diagrams, so the total cost is 2 to the alpha k times k squared. Uh, the previous uh, analysis of this gave 2 to the alpha k times k to the third. And the reason for this is because they don't do this intermediate optimization, which means they have to do many stabilizer to blow, uh, many stabilizer to blow simplifications, which have a k to the third scaling, because k is sort of the number of qubits. So the benefit here comes from sort of uh, evaluating early, because after every decomposition, we simplify the diagram as much as possible. So we are, removed, we are preventing double work in this way, which gives us this better uh, scaling here. Okay, so that's a sort of like um, uh, asymptotic benefit. But we think, in practice, the benefit actually does come from removing additional T-like phases. So we benchmarked on two classes of circuits. Uh, we have these random Clifford plus T circuits, and we built them out of Pauli exponentials. So we have um, Pauli exponentials with uh, two to four legs, and we sort of randomly put them on a circuit with a fixed number of, uh, of, of depth, and on each thing adds one T-gate. And we do these for both 50 and 100 qubit circuits. Um, and then we also have 50 qubit hidden shift circuits, Hidden shift circuits are a particular type of uh, Toffoli or CCZ circuits. Uh, so there's C the CCZ circuits, and you can decompose the CCZ gate into T gates. We use the uh, seven T gate decomposition, not the four T gate decomposition, because that turned out to work better. Um, and we are sampling from the output distribution using strong simulation. So using strong simulation, we reduce the weak simulation. And we implemented all the code in Quizix, which is an open source Rust port of Pizix. You can uh, find it on GitHub. Um, if you can struggle through the lack of documentation, but it is there. Um, so, so first, um, let me show you an interesting fact about this method. So this is um, how many circuits we managed to successfully sample in under five minutes for a given T count. 
And we see that for 50 qubit circuits, at around 40 to 50 T gates, it becomes harder, it, becomes, it takes longer to simulate. While for 100 qubit circuits, it takes, uh, we, we can do it for much longer. We can do up to 67 T gates. So this seems really weird at first because we have more qubits and the problem becomes easier somehow. But it's because we're doing optimization and this optimization is also on the states and the, and the effects and they sort of consume many of the t-gates on the outside. So because we have a less deep circuit for a fixed number of t-gates, we can optimize more. So this sort of shows you the benefit of optimization, like it kills this uh, additional stuff here. Um, then this shows our benefit of using these better decompositions. So here the BSS refers to the 6 to 7 decomposition, and then this CAT stage refers to all the other things I talked about. And we, we see that um, even for 20 qubit circuits, we already see an order of magnitude improvement in running time uh, for, for, for TCON 43. So even for these small circuits, like it's already, you see this, the scaling goes much, much better. Uh, this is a graph about, so as I said, like we are decomposing our diagrams. And then we are simplifying and hopefully removing T-gates. And if you're removing T-gate, this means that we need less terms, right? Because we need less decomposition of the diagrams into separate things. So we can ask, okay, how many fewer terms do we, do we require as opposed to not doing any optimization at all? So on the left, this is what, it, uh, what the amount of, this is a reduction in number of terms required versus no optimization versus our method. And I want to stress that the, uh, the Y-axis is logarithmic. So this goes in hundreds of orders of magnitude improvement in number of terms you need. Um, and we go up to TCON 1400, so we can simulate really, really big circuits. These are 50 qubit uh, circuits with 1400 T gates. Uh, and on the right-hand side, because you, you could argue, like, okay, well, okay, so circuit optimization helps, but what if I just don't use select diagrams and I just use a regular circuit optimization strategy, right? And then I do my regular approach. So what we do on the right-hand side is we compare doing a single optimization step and then doing stabilized decompositions versus op uh, optimized decomposition, optimized decomposition, optimized decomposition. And it's still, it's still a logarithmic plot, and we see that we still get a couple of orders of magnitude, fewer terms that, that are required to simulate these circuits. Um, yeah, and again, I want to iterate, like the previous best for these simulation methods, they could do a, a, CC, a hidden shift circuit with, I think, 64 T gates, and we can go up to 1400. So this is a, quite a big improvement. Uh, yeah, so this is the running time uh, of a 100 random 50 qubit hidden shift circuit with TCON 1400 and how many seconds it takes. And this is running on a laptop. So we can simulate these 50 qubit circuits in a couple of minutes just on a consumer laptop. Okay, so um, we see that we can use ZX to greatly speed up stabilizer rank simulations, especially for structured circuits. So we had these random. Uh, random cleft prestige circuits, and there it works, but not super well. But for the CCZ circuits, it, it just works super, super well. Um, and additionally, using ZX diagrams, we can use these better decompositions, these, these cat state decompositions, that it's, it's not clear how you would even like, find these if you're representing them as a circuit, like you really need the ZX structure here. Um, and the moral of the story here is that optimization and simulation are not separate, they're about the side, two sides of the same coin. Because really, simulation is just optimizing so much until you just are left with a number, right? It's sort of the extreme case of, of uh, optimization. Uh, future work is many things. Um, so use more diagram optimizations. Right now, we're only using sort of this established strategy, which was built for unitary diagrams. But here we are working with a scalar diagram. So it's, we can probably do more stuff to sim simplify it. Uh, the second thing is find heuristics for picking good spiders to decompose. And uh, we have a master student here in the audience who might be working on that right now. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was doing exact strong simulation. So the question is, can we do approximate simulation or better weak simulation or use stabilized extent methods, which are known to scale better, but it's unclear how you would combine them with this method. So it's interesting to if you try that. Um, and yeah, I said that we have this doubling technique to calculate marginal probabilities, but we can use this. Uh, There's this recent paper um, by names I forgot, I'm sorry, but it's called something like quantum measurement without computing marginals. And they show how you can uh, do strong simulation, or you can do weak simulation using strong simulation without calculating marginals so that you can prevent this double counting argument. And we actually do have a master student that has already implemented this, and it does seem to work quite well in, in a variety of cases. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things that we could try that didn't fit on the slide. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. Here's some further reading if you're interested in this. And uh, yeah, thanks.
So when you said the CCZ circuits worked better when you decomposed into seven T gates, I'm assuming that's because that's exactly the decomposition into phase gadgets? Yes. And so if so, does that mean that the the two classes of circuit which you benchmarked on, one is purely gadgets and the other one is, is just kind of pure pure phase gadgets? What what do the hidden shift circuits look like apart from the CCZs? Um, they are a combination of Hadamards and CCZs in a um, quite regular pattern. Um, I think it has like four layers of Hadamards and you sort of do CCZ on the top half of the circuit and then Hadamards everywhere and then CCZ on the bottom half of the circuit, something like that. Cool, thanks. Yeah, also to iterate this 4T card decomposition, so um, probably that might work better if you um, if you use more sophisticated t kind reduction techniques, because our thing is sort of like a black box technique that doesn't look, that it isn't t kind specific. If you were to use, say, um, spider nest identities or um, the Tolt compiler or uh, the Reed Muller encoding stuff, then it, this might actually be the thing you want to do. Uh, thanks, John. Very cool stuff. Um, what about memory use? You showed us time, but you didn't show us anything about memory. We go uh, depth first, so there's essentially no memory use. So I, the, it seems like maybe you already answered this question now with the previous question, but uh, with the hidden shift circuits, how many Clifford gates uh, do you have per CCZ? Because at, at least in the versions that I've seen, there are also like degree one and degree two terms, uh, but it seems like you're only doing the CCZs. Um, Alex, can you an answer this? <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, in these hidden shift circuits, there are these Majorana McFarland uh, bent functions or something like that, right? And uh, the CCZ gates correspond to the degree three terms, so that's not just Clifford, right? But then there's also, uh, at least in the uh, Bravi Gossett paper, they also had, uh, you know, the, the degree one, degree two terms corresponding to Z and CZ, CZ gates. And my own simulations, the reason I ask is because so with, with the 4A hyperpivot, you can actually do the hidden shift circuits uh, just completely via uh, only like reductions, right? Hmm. Or, or in the sum of paths, the, the HH thing, right? Uh, and the number of Clifford gates ends up kind of uh, th th affecting the runtime, at least in, in my stuff. So hmm. yeah, I'm just curious. So since our final diagrams um, get rid of all the Clifford stuff and you're only left with non-Clifford spiders, I don't think it would affect it very much. But this, this remark you made that, that uh, actually the, the path sum approach or the free output actually fully reduces it. I, I hadn't realized that as a thing. So yeah, I guess that, that, would be, that would be the best way to actually simulate these things, but yeah. <laughs> well, so, what? I know. Oh, yeah. So I, I actually just ran this 1400 uh, T-gate circuit uh, through mine. Well, not not just now, a couple days ago, because I was giving a talk at another workshop. Uh, so 450 Clifford gates per CCZ gate uh, takes one minute on my laptop, just doing the, the simplifications. Nice. nice. So yeah, yeah, I, I was curious what that compared, because if I bump yeah, it up yeah. to like 100 yeah. Clifford yeah, gates I mean, per are, CCZ, it takes a little bit longer. There, there, are, there are a couple of other reasons to think, like the hidden shift search are really not the best thing to test, we tested them because they were used in the previous benchmarks, we wanted to be comparable to them. Yeah. Um, we are now also looking at like, other classes of circuits and like, do they work well, do they not work well. I think we looked at IQP circuits as well and there it seems to work uh, also quite good. Um, so yeah, but the hidden shifts are not like the ideal test pad for this method, I think. Yeah, that's true. But Yeah, yeah exactly. I kind of feel like the, these hidden shift circuits might be like, just efficiently computable. Yeah. I kind of, anyway, I'll stop talking. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? I had a more general question about this alpha. Is that any known lower bounds, like based on the strong exponential time hypothesis or anything like that? Um, yes. 
So there is an explicit non-conditional lower bound which says that KT magic states, I think, have stabilizer rank at least K. Okay. <laughs> uh, that is the, that is the um, non-conditional non lower bound. Okay. There is an interesting paper where they showed that, like, they asked what does the scaling have to be in order to improve on existing set solvers? If you just like, if you just okay. encode your set solver as like a, a thing here, as like as like a, a quantum circuit, and you do a strong simulation on it, and there the scaling has to be the alpha you need to have is like to the 10 to the minus 8 or something. Oh. So that's to be really really small not to improve on set solvers. Okay. Um, that's pretty good. Um, I think there's also a conditional bound that if the exponential time hypothesis then it has to be exponential in some in some sense but oh, yeah. Okay. yeah right because the strong gives you a bit allows you to say a bit more sometimes yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah okay uh anyone else if not let's uh thank john again <laughs>